we have the right to inhabit our land, to use our land. Our culture is about sustaining that relationship with the plants, the animals, in a forest. I did start um, drawing a lot in the, in the residential school, really not knowing um, my culture and traditions. And I'm very proud to be here today. My name is Halos, and this is my squia. Welcome to episode 11 of Voices of Sea Chef. This is Chief Calvin Cragen. He is your host and in a very unique position to be the only First Nations chief, hereditary or executive who hosts his own political television talk show in Canada, which is an amazing accomplishment. And as we said, this is episode 11. What makes this one so special is that we recently, Chief, had your annual General Assembly. And because you're a man who really deeply understands the need to communicate, you commissioned a, a, a mini movie, seven minutes, called 150 Years of Progress, which was a major accomplishment. And uh, you got original music from Near Blue. It was produced from the communications department and uh, Tamar Kozlov was, was the woman who literally put the pieces together with Stephen Festchuk. It's narrated by Candice Campo, your cultural director. And as difficult it is as to put together 150 years of this nation, I thought it was a very effective job. Yeah, I, we had to uh, try to showcase not only our people, but the history of our people and where we had our beginnings. In the beginning, we had very little to work with. We didn't have a band office. We never had a computer. We never had an accountant. We never had any legal representation. So we had to go back to demonstrate to our people the things and the tools that we had to work with which was very little as compared to today. Now today we are able to have accountants, lawyers, consultants, media people. We're all focused on the future of our people. After 150 years, this is exactly the vision that our hereditary chiefs wanted. This is where they seen our people going because our people were very independent, they were very progressive, and the young people demonstrate that today by not only taking on education, taking the roles on of being leaders, and studying the language, but doing it in a way that is shisha, and I think that is very purposeful, and the meaning of that goes a long way. I think it was particularly poignant that this seven minutes is beautifully done I know the producers really used your heart and your spirit to let them be guided, but it was uh, dedicated to a certain lovely woman. Do you remember that? <laughs> this is 150 Years of Progress, the Seashaft Nation. Enjoy. Long, long ago, our creator, Kwatam Satlam, he came down from the heavens to this area. He came with a great purpose. The Creator came down to this area and He built our mountains, He built our oceans, our rivers, our creeks. Creator built all of the forest, all of the trees, and all of the plants. He then went on to create the animals. He created Tachal Milch, animals of the land. He created the sea animals, the creatures that could fly and the creatures that could crawl. When Creator completed that part of his work, he then traveled back up to the heavens. He went up to the heavens and he gathered his children, the Spilamoth, the divine creatures. Creator brought his children down to this region that we know today. When Creator completed all of his work, he brought all of his children together, all of the Spilamoth, and he gave them very specific direction that they must always share and care for one another. They must always teach each other, and they must share their skills, and that's how the Seashots became one people. Hoi. Before contact, our people lived in harmony with, not just themselves, but they lived in harmony with the land. They had a unique way of speaking, but they also had a unique way of uh, 
being a family, a large, large family. There were thousands and thousands upon thousands of Sishaf people. What, what there was was harmony, and harmony is something that we've lacked over the last hundred years or so, uh, because we've been separated from our land, from our families, from our language. It used to be 7,000 strong in Deserted Bay, and the canoers went to Gaston. From that evening, they were given uh, some uh, blankets. They didn't know it was smallpox in there, and they brought it back home. They wanted to get rid of our people of a long time ago. They get rid of them, so they take over the land. They, they wiped out all of Deserted Bay people, and there were my relatives there. One of the things that we had to endure was the burning of all of our regalia and our sacred masks. But there's also a spiritual component to it that it's still in our hearts, so therefore we're able to still produce our, our art, which is the collective identity of our people. The spirit is still alive, and every winter the spirit will come down from the mountains. With the wind change, we call that first cold wind that comes down from the mountains Tole Chinam. That means very cold wind. But in that wind comes the spirit. One of the things that our people have had to overcome and are still working to overcome has been the, the dark legacy of the residential school. And there was horrendous things that happened to previous generations. Indian Affairs and the missionaries started to take our children and put them into residential schools here at Seashell. They were kidnapping the kids and then going right in the houses and kidnapping the kids. And I was one who was kidnapped a few times. I, I ran away from the school four times. Naturally, the grandmothers, the aunties, uncles followed because they wanted to be with their children. And that's one of the main reasons why our people were forced to amalgamate here. It wasn't by choice. It was a big discussion amongst our hereditary chiefs how they would approach the amalgamation. And I heard that they were influenced by the what you would refer to as a poetic speech by Charlie Roberts, which was full, the, full of compassion for our people. And he stated that we we're all brothers and sisters and we must always remember that and stick together. And I thought I heard we're just under a hundred people with all the, the nations that were together. Those chiefs from those bands came under one. In my vision, I see myself de-amalgamating my people and bringing them back to their natural villages. And the vision of our forefathers was that they wanted to be not only independent, but they wanted to have their jurisdiction, their rights, their rightful place within our land. Clarence Joe was very vital in the the Seashoth movement in so many different levels, with the fisheries, with logging, fighting for our rights as a people. I just have the deepest respect for him as a Seashoth person because he really helped our people move forward. So the 1980s were a unique period in our, our people's lives. We um, had acquired self-government, uh, a legislative style in 1986. And prior to 1986, our people had already begun taking over their own administration of our government. So we were, we were prepped and ready, so to speak. What our elders brought back and what a lot of our staff brought back was our language and that's the main fabric of our people. If you were to go forward 150 years or more from now, would I see and would I envision for the Seashell people by living from a place of spirit, we'll be able to provide our, our best to each other and to the greater community. I do see integration, I see our culture thriving, I see a land that is restored, an environment that is restored.
people are picking up the drum. More and more people are beginning to sing the songs. And where we want to be again is where we left off 100 years ago, 150 years ago. So it's going to be a full circle. We're going to reverse what the government had caused us. Now we're going to go back to the traditional ways of governing. And I think that's going to be exciting for me to see that in my lifetime. At 70 years old now, I can, I can see it. I can almost feel it. Yeah. <laughs> A hundred and fifty years of progress. Now, I know you're particularly uh, proud of the singer who sang throughout the movie uh, in, in, in very pointed, beautiful songs, and it was the Mayuk song, the Bear song, that Near Blue literally orchestrated into notes. But who is the singer on that again? Someone we know and love. Yeah, it was, uh, I'm happy and proud to say it was my grandson, Sito, and the way he brought it on and the way it was combined with modern music and classical music and together and blending it in with our traditional songs was just perfect. Yeah, it was wonderful and I'm sure you enjoyed it. When we return, we're going to be interviewing a man that has brought a fresh wind to Seashelt and uh, is a changed man in every way and his name is Mayor Bruce Milne and he's our guest next on Voices of Seashelt. Welcome back to Voices of Sea Chef. And Chief, we've got a very special guest, the first time he's been on the show since his election. And uh, Bruce Milne has brought a new feel because he's governing in a time when there's rights and title, uh, people are nervous, they don't know what it means. And it seems like when the right time comes along, the right person is elected. And I think Bruce falls into that category because it's about cooperation, it's about collaboration, it's about co-governance in some capacity and uh, on that note why don't we welcome Bruce Mill. Mayor, welcome to the show. Well thank you for welcoming Bruce. I'm honored to be here. It's always a always an honor to work with the Sea Shelf and also to be in the Longhouse. Yeah. It, it, um, you knew coming in, in before this election that this nation is rising. It has it's in negotiations with the province. Um, it's unsettling I think in some cases because Sometimes rumor precedes fact. So when people say to you, Mayor, are we, is our, our lives going to change once these rights and titles are settled? Uh, what do you say to them? I'll say, I hope it changes, and I hope it changes for the better. Mm -hmm. No, of course it'll change. The nation has always been strong, as you say, but it's been coming into a new strength and a new uh, role and identity in the last um, 25, 30 years in particular. Um, we go back to 1986. I actually moved into the Seashelf territory in 1986, the same day in summer that the Seashelf got their first government in 1986, their self-government under the federal system. Of course, they've had their autonomous government um, for many years, but the self-government under the federal system. And in that period of time, there's been a lot of strength, a lot of growing, and as you say, a lot of cooperation, collaboration, working with others. Because the world is large, we always have to work with those that are around us. And uh, we've seen that with the Sea Shelf in the last while. The most important issues that are coming now are issues of reconciliation. It's more than, more than collaboration, more than just working together, but actually coming to understand the other person and reconcile with that history that is ours, the shameful part, and theirs, uh, the oppression, uh, and understand how we move forward on that. In your career, you've been uh, a negotiator as well on the government side. What what did you learn from sitting with governments uh, and negotiating with First Nations that you bring to the job you hold today? Well, I think I learned some patience, and uh, we certainly learned that it's a challenge. Um, and it's a challenge because the views of different parties are so different. Uh, there's no question that the federal government, the crown, the provincial government have uh, views on sovereignty and on, on how uh, authority works 
which are very different than uh, the views of Seashelf and other First Nations in terms of sovereignty and how authority works. And uh, it's difficult to genuinely reconcile some of those opposing views. So I learned that we do need to open up uh, the federal and provincial crown view that sovereignty can be shared. It's something that actually needs to be shared if understood fully. It's not an exclusive um, it's not an exclusive term that I have sovereignty and you can't have it. In fact, we all need that if we're going to have any certainty going forward. We have to open up the notion of authority and sovereignty. And I think I learned that through the negotiations, through the lessons, through le learning about the mandates the federal government had, what was behind their mandates. And then also in those deep discussions and years of negotiations where we learn and listen to what the First Nations perspective is, uh, which is of course very different than the perspective of the Crown. Chief, you've often spoken of a, a reconciliatory uh, relationship, which really, as you've told me and this audience many times, requires a deeper understanding between the two parties. Could you elaborate on that for us? Yeah, again, it's another um, process of education. And, and I'm honored that the mayor is here today because the mayor recognizes that there is a dynamic, there is a difference in how we govern. When you consider and look at how the federal government could, uses its power and its control, we don't do that. Our self-government was based on sharing. It was based on a vision that our forefathers had in terms of how they stewarded the land and the resources that we occupied. And throughout the last 150 years, many Europeans have moved into our territory and we had to learn how to live with that and we expect that because we respect them and we honor them they are our guests we expect the same in return so if we have that, that respect and recognize that respect I think um, there'll be a future for us and how we coexist how we share in those resources how we share in controlling and stewarding all those resources in the future. So Mayor, you probably are watching Pender Harbor with interest, and it's a flashpoint. Mm -hmm. In many ways, it's what might happen in many other areas. Um, do you have anything to say about how that's being managed in terms of mitigating the fear that people have, which is unrealistic? I mean, from the short time I've been communications director with this nation, I have learned from their history, they've never taken anything away from anybody. And yet there's that palpable fear. Uh, what advice would you give from your experience? Well, I think the, the real advice is to remember that it is an educational process, as the chief just said, and that it is about sharing, always has been, and, and to relax. And part of the difficulty is that my community, our community, we were educated and trained and raised with a fairly exclusive sense of authority, and there's, there's a strong father usually in the household or a strong mother but that runs, and then there's the crown and the federal government that runs things. And, and we transfer that over when we hear of other people coming and the seashells wanting to have a presence. We think, well, they'll want the same kind of unilateral or exclusive authority. And we don't understand how sharing works. We simply don't. So we need to just step back a little bit um, think about how the process works and what a different way of looking at things might be. And we'll find that there's lots of room for docks in Pender Harbor. There'll still be places to tie up the boats when they come in from the, from the sea. And, uh, and it will be, will be fine. What we do both share, in the Pender Harbor is the example, is the concern for the environment. Almost all of the um, uh, protocols that have been put in place by the seashell for the dock management are about conserving and protecting the long-term environment and the cultural traditions and history that are there. We all want to do that. So as soon as we realize that in fact it's not about displacing one exclusive authority with a new authority, this isn't about the Seashelf becoming the new federal government and the new Chief Calvin isn't going to become the new Stephen Harper. <laughs> He's going to be a very different man. <laughs> He's there to share those things with us. And I think that's important for us to, to recognize that just don't assume that the new is going to be what you understand of the old. And we do that all the time, all of us. We only know from our history and our past, so we project that into the future. We think, well, tomorrow is going to be just like today. It's not. It's going to be different because there's different people and different people to work with, and so the collaboration will expand 
And so I think if in Pender Harbor in particular, and it's not as rocky uh, a start as people have sometimes said, but in, the, in Pender Harbor, it's a matter of just stepping back, learning a little bit more, educating, and, uh, and recognizing that it's not the world that you think it is. It's actually a more open world, a more transparent, and a little more shy. Chief, is that reflective of how you see things? Yeah, I, honestly, I believe that there is a bit of fear, and that exists when change happens. But they have to understand that their values are maybe different from ours, but they have to understand that we have to get together and protect the resources that they have now. The experience that they're having now, they're having beautiful waterfront, they're having ecosystems that are pristine. We've all got to get, get together and take on that responsibility of protecting that ec ecosystem. If we violate that, then it all could turn into a desert. I mean, we've seen places in other parts of the world where if you don't respect the land and you violate the land, it'll turn to desert, it'll turn against you. And always our elders have taught us that. We must have respect for the land. We must take care of the land. Otherwise, that land will not sustain our people. And we knew and understand that. That was a vision of our people. And right now, um, we're learning new words like fee simple, ownership, control. Those words never existed in our culture. And we continue to share in our land. We continue to uh, be good neighbors. We continue to always be um, cognizant of what their values are, but they have to understand ours. That's a good point. We'll be back after these messages with Mayor of Seashell, Bruce Milne, and of course our chief on Voices of Seashell. Welcome back to Voices of Seashoth. Chief, our guest is uh, the mayor of Seashell, Bruce Milne. He's a newly elected mayor. And uh, without comparing, how would you compare him to the last mayor? Well, I think uh, Bruce brings back um, experience being a negotiator in, in the treaty process. And he has an understanding now of where the Seashaw people are coming from. And in comparison to the former mayor, I think he had a different understanding of the collaboration and the relationship that we had. I don't think he had much of a vision in terms of how that could look in the future. Whereas I think Bruce could see in the future of how working together, we're going to learn how to build this community. Bruce, that's a pretty fine compliment. Well, I appreciate it. I think one of the differences too is the, um, that sometimes our culture works within contracts and business, whereas I'm coming from a position of community and building community, and that's what we share together. So when we talk about partnerships, it's partnerships with the Sea Shelf as community, building that community together. It's not about a, a business contract that we might have. Of course, we may have those as well, but that's not the basis of what we do. It's the basis is building a community to, to live here together. So, if things go well in this tenure, and you may get another one after if you choose to, what will people say about the way you governed in your time as mayor? What would you like them to say? What will be your legacy? Well, you know I was elected before. Yes. And uh, I served two terms. And I got an email when I left office last time from a citizen out in Tawanek that said, welcome back. Citizen, Citizen Milne, uh, you still have your integrity. Wow. And that is the most important, I think, for all of us. I heard earlier the chief talk about righteousness and, and moving forward on moral grounds. And I think if the community understands that we've governed in their interests, not in our own, and we've kept our integrity, that's the important thing for leaders to do. What are the two biggest issues you face as Mayor Seashell at this time? Well, I think that... Um, the ongoing collaboration in future, uh, what the economic and community future looks like with the sea shelf, with our neighbors and with ourselves and our own sense of identity. We have to shift our own identity a little bit in sea shelf. As the sea shelf identity grows, uh, we also have to adjust and, and do that. 
And I think community building. I think uh, trust is always the number one issue for elected officials, even if they don't want to say it is. Mm -hmm. Trust is always the issue, and that's a major issue for us. So would you say the third might be, how do you hold people to the community? How do you deal with youth? How do you provide the magnet to hold the population and grow it with the resources you have? Well, I think the difference there is that I think the community does have bonds, that people do want to be held together. The magnet is the community itself. It's actually not the economy. So I don't focus on jobs to, to attract young people. I focus on the community to attract young people that want to stay here, and then they create wealth opportunities. They create a new world. It's not my world. Chief and I may have an old world. The new world is being created by the young, and we have to create the conditions for them to do that. Well, that's, uh, that's a good legacy to leave behind. Chief, we're nearing the end of episode 11. We've had some magnificent people on the show. Um, Bruce, you are definitely the most well-spoken mayor we've had. <laughs> now, it also falls we haven't had any of their mayors on, but you <laughs> so it's a backhanded compliment. Yeah. But it's a delight to have you on the program. Will you come back? I'd be glad to come back and honored to be in the Longhouse. Tremendous. Chief, I throw to you for the words of wisdom on this show, and that will lead us to the next. Well. It's been a great day. I think we've had some very spectacular guests. I'm very happy that the mayor was here. I'm honored that he was on. I'm also honored that you had the opportunity to mention that they honored my wife at the AGA. I mean, it took me by surprise with that one, but I'm happy about that. Yeah. It was a permanent honoring. Uh, she will always be associated with that AGA film. Bruce, until we meet again, uh, best wishes for you and your role. I mean, you couldn't govern from a more beautiful place. That's the start. You get up in the morning, you look at your city. It's not Detroit. Yeah, half the battle is done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it for Voices of Sea Chef. We will see you again next time. Thank you for watching. We have the right to inhabit our land, to use our land. Our culture is about sustaining that relationship with the plants, the animals, in a forest. I did start um, drawing a lot in the, in the residential school, really not knowing um, my culture and tradition. And I'm very proud to be here today. My name is Hewos, and this is my squeak.